so in the previous videos, we talked about unipolar and bipolar mood disorders. And uh, what we're going to do now are talk about various treatments of these conditions. And similar to the video that I have on the models of treatment, we're going to go through the ones that are applicable uh, and it, it'll also mirror what we did with anxiety disorders. Uh, so let's start. So when we talk about uh, treatments, uh, we know that in general, people who receive mental health treatment with mood disorder, it tends to be pretty effective. And there are different models of treatment, such as talk therapy, electroconvulsive shock therapy, hospitalization, uh, medications such as antidepressants or mood stabilizers and many others, right? So there's a broad range of treatment modalities we have. So let's go into them and see, see where this takes us, right? So we see that in terms of depression, one out of three people receive some form of a mental health treatment from a professional each year, right? So, so there is a strong uh, seeking of mental health. So that's about 33 or 34% of people. And that's pretty high when you think about it, but why is it uh, high? Well, it could be that there's uh, other flags going up. Let's say a person has an eating disorder, for example, it, it is uncommon for people with depression to have disordered eating, and uh, it's not uncommon to have co-occurring diagnoses uh, of the two as well. So when we think of psychotherapy, there are different models of treatment, as you'll recall from uh, lecture three, but the ones that stand out are the psychodynamic behavior and cognitive models. Um, and we're going to go through them. Then we'll talk about sociocultural biological treatments. Now, I see a couple of people message me that they came in late. I will give you partial credit, um, but I have, I'll do that at the end of the class. So don't worry about it for now. All right. So let's talk about psychodynamic uh, uh, treatment. So when we talk about psychodynamic or psychoanalytic treatment, this comes from Freud and Freud's followers. And in general, where does mental health or uh, depression come from? It could come from real or imagined losses, right? So if a person has real or imagined loss, that could be turned inward and develop uh, depression as a function of that. We also see uh, based on dependency uh, versus independence, people who have excessive dependency on others that could uh, turn into some form of a depressive mood state. So how do we treat uh, uh, depression from a psychodynamic point of view? The first thing is to bring things from the unconscious to the conscious, right? So helping people become more aware of these uh, deep-seated feelings and, and where they might be coming from. So if there were, you know, an imagined loss or a, a real loss, whether it be a loss of a job, a loss of a romantic partner, things like that, bringing the, the feelings surrounding those losses to one's uh, conscious experience helps us uh, work through it. There's also free association. You may recall free association was uh, allowing our client to say whatever comes to mind and whatever comes to mind, there's nothing off limits, but usually when people are saying whatever comes to mind, there's something important that pops up and then we do a deeper dive and that's kind of how free association works. So. Uh, I'll give you an example where we might invite, you know, a person, 
you know, let's say you had a client who was late to session three weeks in a row. As a clinician, it might be good to bring that to the foreground and say, hey, I noticed the last three sessions you've been late. What do you think that might be about? And notice the question is open-ended. Notice you're not uh, assuming any rash reason for it. And then the person will bring whatever they think is going on to the foreground. And then you could do a deeper dive. Psychodynamic treatment also includes dream analysis. Now we talked about Freudian dream analysis and then there's more modern approaches to dream analysis where the, the person having the dream becomes the expert of their dreams rather than looking for these symbols in the dreams. We focus on resistances. Now, when we say a resistance, that is either a conscious or an unconscious uh, pushback to treatment. So for whatever reason, that person is fighting being fully invested in the treatment process. So we explore where some of the resistance might be. So even the example of coming late to session, if a person's late uh, a few sessions in a row, it could be that they're uncomfortable in the treatment room. So there's some resistance or avoidance happening. Can't assume that, right? It could also be traffic related or whatever it might be, but you want to explore where it might be. And then we talk about transference, right? So uh, you may recall uh, transference and countertransference. Um, transference are those feelings that the client projects onto their therapist. And we explore where these uh, transferences are coming from. So a therapist can become a symbol of, uh, let's say, one's parents or upbringing. So there could be positive tra transference based on upbringing or negative transference based on upbringing. Um, I think if you want to look at videos or pop culture movies that include these models, uh, analyze this is a good one. It's an old older film now, uh, but it it has some scenes that show transference where the client is projecting feelings they have towards other people onto their therapist. So what's the goal though? The goal uh, is twofold. One is to help a person become more independent, but also if there is a loss, coping with the losses, whether they be real or imagined, symbolic loss is still a loss, right? So trying to help people deal with whatever the feelings of loss might be. So now let's shift gears to a behavioral model of treatment. So the rationale for the what causes depression from a behavioral model is reduced pleasure, right? And you may recall when we talked about uh, symptoms of depression, there was something called anhedonia. And anhedonia is uh, the loss of pleasure. Now we can have reduced pleasure or we can have the loss of pleasure altogether. So how do we improve depression? Well, some things might be based on behavioral activation. So if there was an activity that a person stopped doing because they uh, no longer derive pleasure from it, we try and reintroduce those activities to the person's life. So let's say a person really enjoyed going to the gym and because they became depressed, they stopped going to the gym. Well, we might note that to the person, say, hey, you, you've mentioned in the past you really love going to the gym, but I notice you're saying you haven't had the energy to go. So we, why don't we try just once this week getting to the gym? So now we're reintroducing exercise to the person's life uh, assuming that that was something they um, enjoyed. And then we 
So that's behavior activation. Another uh, suggestion is that as we get older, we get less and less reinforcement in our life. So another model is to reinforce, you know, both depressive and non-depressive uh, behaviors, but then work through some kind of contingency where we start to remove the reinforcement uh, for the depressive behaviors and then shift towards only the non-depressive behavior. So we start by reinforcing everything to increase pleasure um, and reinforcement in one's life. But through time, we start to expect more of the client and only reinforce uh, constructive uh, behaviors or non-depressed behaviors. We also see that social skills can deteriorate when one is uh, depressed. So encouraging eye contact, assuming that it's not uh, a violation of a cultural norm, right? Teaching people to maintain eye contact, um, have proper facial expressions and so forth are part of this model. So there are these uh, three steps that we use from a behavioral point of view. And uh, we believe that you should have a minimum of these three steps for uh, the behavioral model to work. So if you wanna focus on social skills and re reinforcement, great. If you wanna focus on behavior activation and reinforcement, great. Um, you just have to pick a minimum of two out of the three. Now, a cognitive model of depression, you may recall Aaron Beck talked about the cognitive triad, right? So the cognitive triad um, included um, a negative view of uh, one's uh, future, themselves, and their general experiences. So that that's part of working with um, a person is to challenge the, that negative view of the self, uh, the future and their experiences. We also challenge more general uh, maladaptive attitudes, such as I need to be perfect. And, you know, perfection only occurs in the abstract. So if, if your goal is to be perfect, then you're setting yourself up for failure or disappointment. So helping people realize that the need for perfection is uh, an unattainable goal is useful. So we also focus on uh, cognitive errors, right? And there are a whole host of cognitive distortions that people have or cognitive errors, um, things like catastrophizing, right? So catastrophizing is expecting the worst to happen or or forecasting the worst thing to happen. Mind reading, I know I know this person doesn't like me, right? So that's mind reading. How do you know they don't like you? Have they ever told you they don't like you? More often than not, that's not true. But the person feels um, that that person doesn't like them. So they might draw incorrect conclusions. And then we also peel back the layers uh, like an onion to get to what's called the core belief and the automatic thoughts. Now, core beliefs are at the center of why you feel the way you do, why you believe what you do. And automatic thoughts are your knee-jerk reaction to something happen. So it's not, it, it becomes so reflexive. It's like blinking or breathing. So we have to identify whatever these negative or unwanted automatic thoughts are and replace them with healthier alternatives. So when we do a cognitive model, we oftentimes use something called a thought record where we have a person write the experience they had, the, the feelings they had, the conclusions they uh, made, uh, then we ask them to identify potential uh, cognitive errors 
and then reconstruct the thoughts in a more balanced or fair way. And then we reassess um, how the impact of the cognitive restructuring. So these automatic thoughts are at the core of these incorrect conclusions people make. So uh, cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, which blends the two, the behavior model with the cognitive model, can be really fun because you can actually track and measure behavioral change. You can track when a thought uh, is incorrect and how the person learns to reorganize their thoughts. So cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is pretty powerful. Now, if we're using a cognitive model, uh, it's usually a more short-term model. So if, we, if you were doing a psychodynamic approach, you would probably expect therapy, generally speaking, to be a little bit longer for that deep insight. Whereas uh, cognitive therapy tends to be quicker. So we divide it into different phases. We work on the different um, errors the person's making, and then the person is off on their own. And, and I love the fact that cognitive therapy can be accomplished so quickly because one of the myths of therapy is that you have to be in therapy your whole life. It's not true. There, are, it, Depending on the issue, a person may be in therapy longer or shorter period of time. But if it's one issue you're targeting, you should be able to target it in a half of a year or less, right? The problem is most people don't come in with one, one issue or one problem. And that does extend therapy, even from a, a CBT model. So let's talk about the phases of cognitive therapy. So the, uh, the first phase is increasing activity. So this has a behavioral component and elevating uh, mood. Now we believe the, uh, the person uh, who's increasing the activity that they stop doing, they're gonna start to feel good for one, feel good about oneself. So there is going to be an increased mood or an emotional relief that comes from adding to what one is doing. Now, because most people don't know how to do this on their own or they start not knowing, it is not uncommon in a cognitive model to ask a person to map out their next week's activities so that they can plan for whatever the activity you want to increase, we're gonna say, okay, now, how do we make that happen? Um, working with a client now who's in early adulthood, uh, struggling with his job, you know, he works 12 hour shifts uh, through the evening. And um, yeah, it, it causes problems in his social life and causes problem with working out. So we do spend time saying, okay, well, what can we do this week to address your social life? What can we do this week to address working out? And then we say, okay, now that we know the action you want to take, where are you gonna place this? Well, you have 12 hour shifts. That means that you're working three or four days a week. And then the other days you're free. So let's plan these activities uh, when you're off. And that's kind of the first phase of uh, cognitive therapy, just getting people to do more things that they used to enjoy. And it creates a relief because things will stack up. Now, uh, we also challenge automatic thoughts. Remember automatic thoughts are your knee-jerk interpretations. When we ask a person, to engage in a thought record where they write down their knee-jerk thoughts and then they bring it to therapy and then we put your thoughts on trial. Uh, so if I were to uh, evaluate an automatic thought and put it on trial, I'd say, well, what evidence do you have to support uh, the thought, this particular thought? 
and the person will present whatever evidence, if there was even evidence. Sometimes there isn't evidence, right? And then I ask, well, okay, what's the counter evidence? What evidence do you have against this conclusion? And then we say, okay, based on the totality of the evidence, where are we? So we're now taking those thoughts, uh, evaluating them for accuracy. And uh, what's cool is that uh, it does oftentimes help a person realize that their maladaptive automatic thoughts oftentimes have very little evidence. So it's easy to confront them once you realize that. So I uh, the third step is to identify biases if a person has a particular bias or negative thinking. So again, we know that they come from automatic thoughts. We know that they come from irrational beliefs or illogical thinking. Uh, but we link whatever your bias is to one of these automatic thoughts or illogical uh, thinking. So let's say a person um, said any grade less than an A is terrible. So that is pretty binary, right? It's pretty much black and white thinking, right? So it's all or nothing. So helping the person realize that they engaged in this cognitive error is pretty pretty helpful, right? And then we also push back on any kind of negative overtones uh, that these message might include. So if a person gets an A minus instead of an A, what kind of overtone would that suggest or what kind of conclusion would that suggest? Now it's not an A, it's an A minus. Catalina, what do you think that would suggest? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Uh, if a person got an A minus and they believe that A grade less than an A is terrible, what conclusion would they make about themselves? Um, probably that they they just have to be the best or like perfect always, and anything less than that, they just will feel like they're just the worst person, or they're not living up to their standards. Okay. And not living up to their standards would make them a um, like negative thinker or or illogical thinking. Well, that is what we're trying to teach them. But Bayan, what would that mean? Um, what would that mean about the self? It makes them a. Oh, I'm not sure if this was the right answer or anything. I was thinking that they would probably think that they were worthless. Yeah, that's another conclusion. But more often than not, it would they would draw the conclusion, I got an A minus, therefore I'm a failure, which could link to Bayon's conclusion that if I'm a failure, I'm worthless. And you could see how black and white thinking or all, all or none thinking can really, really uh damage a person and a minus is not a bad grade but if a person feels they need to get all a's that's a lot of pressure so um yeah so that you could see how we identify the bias the person is going to feel that they're a failure they're worthless they're terrible so they internalize the belief about the action and we have to like push back on these negative overtones. And then last but not least, uh, when, when I use the word cognitive restructuring, the goal of cognitive restructuring is to uproot these maladaptive attitudes that set the stage for depression altogether. Now you can't just uproot something without replacing it. So if we have a maladaptive attitude Cognitive restructuring requires us to replace that negative mindset or attitude with a more 
positive mindset. So let's look at uh, other approaches. We talked about Aaron Beck's cognitive therapy, and we see that 50 to 60% of clients respond pretty well uh, with this approach. However, many people say that they do struggle to completely discard their false beliefs or negative cognitions. So are there other things we can do to help? Well, there is a model called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a form of a cognitive behavioral therapy that teaches clients to, to view whatever the negative thoughts uh, are as normal. And it's a normal part of your stream of thought, but try not to become beholden to those thoughts. Allow those thoughts to come to you, but don't become overly committed to them, right? So um, if we allow them to be parts of our stream of thought, the negative thought comes in and then it passes through us. And as a function of that, they no longer become the guides for our behavior, right? Now, um, if a person is able to say, okay, this is just a thought uh, and it's going to pass, then we could start to dissect the ideas or thoughts as well and work around them. So instead of Aaron Beck's model where we want to completely restructure your thoughts or remove negative cognitions, here we're working with the negative cognitions. We're allowing them to be. Now, it's interesting, accept acceptance and commitment therapy has other pieces to it as well. But one of the pieces of acceptance and commitment therapy is uh, that acknowledging what is present for a person at that moment without trying to necessarily solve the problem right away. So a person can say, okay, I recognize that I'm struggling. I recognize that I'm struggling with depression or whatever it might be, uh, but I don't know how to get out of it. So that's the acceptance piece. The commitment piece is the commitment to change. And it's very important just because a person recognizes that they have a problem doesn't mean that they're ready for change right away. So part of the acceptance and commitment therapy model is to allow a person to be where they are and gently move them along. We also need to have uh, culturally appropriate or culturally appropriate uh, sensitive treatments. This modifies traditional cognitive behavioral therapy to the cultural norms or the unique experiences that a minority group might face. And if you look in the literature, there are different techniques. It doesn't have to be a singular technique that you use for every um, individual that comes to you. Knowing what some of the unique issues of the minority group is will increase effectiveness of the treatment. So uh, being culturally responsive or culturally sensitive does improve CBT. Right. So uh, we also recommend, you know, cultural trainings, not that um, a person isn't going to, I don't think from a sensitivity training or some kind of one-off seminar, a person is going to fully appreciate the culture of another person, but it's a starting point. It opens the dialogue. So we want to understand things like cultural stressors or stereotypes or prejudice a, a, a member of a group might experience. And then we talk about uh, strategies that can make them feel more comfortable. We also evaluate our own biases, right? Everybody has personal biases. Uh, so being able to be aware of our biases, even if we're not able to change our biases. Uh, that could help in improving treatment outcomes. So culturally uh, responsive or sensitive counseling does help uh, 
alleviate depression in ethnic minorities. We know that, but the literature is still limited, right? Um, it's still developing. You'll notice that Middle Eastern and Northern African communities are not represented here, right? So the research is still developing, but I will even say beyond the research, the providers uh, who are able to administer culturally sensitive counseling is also limited, right? So we have to be mindful that there are some barriers to treatment with ethnic minorities. So if we we're gonna look from a medical model or a biological model, we even see a lot of the medication, there's less availability or, or, or accessibility to antidepressant medications. So notice we've shifted from the different like therapeutic models to more of a social lens because it's important to understand there isn't a single model of treatment. So we talked about culturally responsive treatment. We also want to make sure that we have uh, family-based treatment, right? So when we talk about family models the uh, or couples models, we're looking at more than one person and how they function uh, with one another. So from, from a family point of view, there's a dynamic that includes many people, but a couples therapy, it's a dyad, just two people. But so we work to explore how uh, depression shows up in the family or in the relationship. So let's say there we'll deal with a couple that one person is struggling from depression and the other person wants to go out for dates. And the person who is depressed just never feels up to going out on dates. Well, that's going to tax the relationship or uh, in a family, a person uh, might have resentment towards other members of the family and lash out, right? So we need to be mindful of what's going on in the family, what's going on in the couple, and how depression shapes that. Now, from an interpersonal uh, psychotherapy model, uh, the belief is that interpersonal problems are what causes the depression. So it could be a whole host of interpersonal issues, whether it be loss or role dispute, um, role transition, or even deficit. So let's go into them, right? So interpersonal loss is um, the loss of a loved one, right? And uh, we talk, it doesn't have to be death. It could be uh, disconnection from the, the loved one. Role dispute, this is one of the more common ones where people have assumptions about their partners, where they expect their partner to behave in a certain way and they don't. And then there's conflict because one of the members of the partnership is ex has an implicit expectation and they fight over it because that's not met. Role transitions are... Uh, an issue too, so any kind of life change, such as uh, parenthood. So a couple uh, who, who do not have children put a strong emphasis on interacting with one another. But once you have a child, there's a shift in your role. You're not just a partner, but you're also a parent. And that shift might alter the dynamic between the couple as well. All right. And then interpersonal deficits is just lacking social skills to develop those strong relationships. So we might teach some social skills. All right. So I went through what these various um, aspects of interpersonal therapy, where the source of depression comes from. So now let's take a look at the models and how we would address that problem. So treating interpersonal loss, first we have to understand what the relationship was like with the person that there was a loss. You explore the relationship, you identify if there 
were any unresolved resentments or anger and you work through that anger and then the end of the treatment would focus on re like reshaping how they view the the loss right how they remember the person so uh perhaps in a more positive or healthy way if it's a role dispute then we try and take implicit beliefs about one's role and have them stated. So I said a couple can fight because one person believes uh, partner A is supposed to do X and partner A isn't doing. Now, we wanna bring that to the surface. We wanna evaluate whether the expectation of the partner is correct. And then we want to motivate change accordingly right so if my assumption of my partner's role is incorrect i have to work on my assumption if the role is being neglected but it is an appropriate expectation of the partner then we encourage that partner to step up so uh role transition we help a person develop social support and uh, skills to embrace a new role so when a person becomes a parent or becomes divorced or even a grandparent, the change in status, a uh, person may not know how to deal with. So we provide additional support and resources for that individual. Now, interpersonal deficits, this was about social skills, right? So first step is to help the person identify, hey, maybe I'm not that good at social skills. And then we teach social skills and assertiveness training. So let's talk about couples therapy, right? So according to uh, a couple's model, uh, depression can come from marital discord, right? So uh, couples therapy is designed to try and help resolve whatever the discord is. And if we were to think about uh, couples, uh, one of the biggest problems couples face is healthy communication styles. So teaching people how to speak with one another or identify some of the, the traps that they might engage in. So we help an individual commu communicate more effectively and also problem solve as a team. So I have a couple now where... Uh, one individual is overspending and breaking the budget, so to speak. And that causes anger and resentment to the other person. So one of the activities I encouraged is that they should sit down and develop a monthly budget together. And when you develop that monthly budget together, both parties are seeing the same thing. They're seeing how much money is coming in. They're seeing how much money is going out. They're seeing the areas where the budget might need to be increased or decreased. And then as a, as a, a union, they're solving that problem. So it's, it's actually uh, team-based problem solving. So interpersonal therapy is very uh, powerful, uh, and uh, couples therapy is very powerful uh, in dealing with some of the relational stuff. And if you look at couples therapy and interpersonal therapy, they work just as well as cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. So outcomes in cognitive therapy, through time, people report uh, a strength in their relationship when they experience couples therapy um, relative to when they don't. And they also experience the issues in their couple or their union gets targeted better than in an individual uh, therapy. So now let's talk about biological treatments. So electroconvulsive shock therapy is a model for treating uh, very severe and treatment resistant depression. And I think it's very important to state that electroconvulsive shock therapy is not your first model, 
right? We're going to do a talk therapy. We might do talk therapy with medication or whatnot. Um, but if, if nothing is working and the person is so paralyzed, we might explore electroconvulsive shock therapy. And why, if, if we're going to be causing seizures and, and, you know, altering the current in the brain, that could have some significant risks attached to it. Why are, why are we still doing it? You might ask. The answer is it works. It works. Um, when you have treatment resistant depression, we see ECT tends to work. One of the criticisms though, is that it works for a certain period of time and then you need boosters. So you're gonna get ECT and then you're gonna feel better. And then maybe six months down the road, you might need ECT again, or a year down the road, you might ECT again. So what is it? So electroconvulsive shock therapy, we're passing anywhere between 65 to 140 volts of electricity in a split second, right? Uh, through uh, the brain, right? So um, the reason why I say it's a split second or a half a second is because that if it was sustained, it would electrocute the person. But uh, because it's a, a split second or a half, a half of a second, it, it only induces seizures, right? So there, the seizure that a person experiences it will, it, it will last for a couple minutes at most. And, uh, but it's almost like the old Nintendo game that got frozen. You hit the reset button and it starts, the, the start screen and it moves again. So ECT is kind of like that. The person is so depressed or paralyzed and frozen, ECT is like hitting the reset button and starting over. And these, Sessions are pretty close together. You can have anywhere between six to 12 sessions in a matter of a couple weeks. And the, there's also a question um, whether it's on one side of the brain or both sides of the brain. Uh, that's based on what the clinician's best judgment is. So it can be unilateral or bilateral. Now, ECT is uh, an old treatment. It's been around for a while, right? So um, originally when they attempted to develop ECT, they were hoping to um, deal with psychosis, right? So they, uh, they were dealing with schizophrenia and try trying to induce seizures to deal with schizophrenia. In fact, if you go all the way back, you'll see if you watch the movie A Beautiful Mind, which is another older movie, they introduce, um, you know, these models of treatment, seizure-based treatments uh, with insulin coma therapy, which is a form of inducing seizures with psychotic patients to hit the reset button. Uh, ultimately, uh, we said, yeah, that works, but we have a safer way, a better way of inducing seizures through electrical current. So we started with gluco glucose or insulin-based uh, seizures, and then we switched over to electroconvulsive shock therapy. Now here's the deal. It works for depression, but does not work uh, for schizophrenia or psychotic disorders. So it's important to know that. Now, we learned the hard way, but we also needed to learn that when a person is convulsing, we need to give um, muscle relaxants so that the people don't break bones. And we did it in a, in a wakeful state, and, and now it's not done so much in a wakeful state. So there are some things that we learned along the way, right? So... Uh, I mentioned the muscle relaxants, right? I, I mentioned uh, the issues with broken bones. Uh, we also talk about uh, sedative hypnotics or barbiturates that are given to help people sleep through the process. Uh, the problem, 
that we see is that there is a moment in time or a period of time where there is memory loss or or and through time brain damage. So it takes time after ECT for a person to get their memory back, right? So there are uh, gaps in memory. So that's the criticism. However, we do see that it works with a very um, high percentage, so 60 to 80% of people with ECT, it improves their mood. So why not always do it? Well, we talked about the potential problems with memory loss and brain damage. We also need to understand that talk therapy is pretty powerful in most cases. So we're not going to use the most invasive measure first. We're going to try the least invasive and then move forward. So let's talk about drug treatment. So um, there are different pharmaceutical drugs we use for treating depression. Now, this is not in the most ideal order. The, the first approach should be SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, but we have a whole host of treatments. The most broad spectrum treatment is called MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And if we go backwards, it explains how it works. So inhibitor means it inhibits a process, right? Oxidase, anything with an ASE is an enzyme and it breaks something down. So we're inhibiting the breakdown of something, right? And then go back to monoamine uh, and put it all together. So what do MAOIs do? We inhibit the breakdown of monoamines, things like um, serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine, right? Because they're all monoamines and uh, it works. The problem is, is if you have too much serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine in, in the system, it can have significant side effects. Uh, and anything that has the precursor to um, a monoamine, you want to reduce in your diet. So uh, tyramine can be converted into these neurotransmitters. So anything that has tyramine in there, like cheese or wine or bananas, they're out, or chocolate even, they're out of your diet uh, because they can build up and it can become problematic. So another approach that we tried were tricyclic medication. So tricyclic, uh, medication, uh, is it's called that based on the molecular structure. It's a form of an antidepressant that has uh, a carbon ring in the middle uh, or three, three ring uh, molecular structure, better yet. And we realized that tricyclics worked for depression by accident, which is the case with a lot of our medication. Um, we were trying to use tricyclics for for schizophrenia did not work, but it worked for depression. So we said, oh, well, if this works, then maybe we should start to use it. There are some uh, problems with tricyclics. It takes time for them to start working. Uh, and how do tricyclics work? They block the reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine, right? So we talked about these are the two neurotransmitters linked to mood disorders. So you, we have more serotonin in the system. We have more norepinephrine in the system. And it eventually starts working. We see that um, the effectiveness is 60 to 65% of depressed patients. Now, if we look at that percentage, it's higher than MAOIs. So because it's more effective, coupled with the fact that there are fewer dietary restrictions, tricyclics uh, supplanted MAOIs as the ideal drug treatment for depression. Now, when should we um, discharge with tricyclic medication? So we have to be gradual. We have to be strategic. Because if we 
improve the mood and then we pull the tricyclics right away, we see that there is a, a sharp uh, relapse rate, which means that there's going to be a second uh, episode of depression within a year. If we were to uh, wait five months after uh, treatment is done and the, and the mood disorder is gone, we see a drop off of relapse, right? Which means that there's less likelihood of de developing depression. So that was referred to as con continuation therapy. So that's followed with, what if we extended it further? Well, three plus years after treatment, we see that relapse drops even further. And we call this maintenance uh, therapy. Now, the problem with that is, basically, you are wind up being on these medications for the rest of your life based on this data. So the person has taken tricyclics uh, over and over and over. Now, for a person who is very, very conservative about medication, tricyclics don't seem all that great of an option. So uh, we need other models, right? So here we have uh, other models that are out there for anti-depression. So we have SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They increase serotonin levels by blocking the, the reabsorption of serotonin, but they don't mess with the other neurotransmitters. And I think that's important because that's why serotonin be SSRIs become your first line treatment. Now, MAOIs messed with serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. No good. Tricyclics, you were on uh, indefinitely. Uh, here, we have more targeted treatment, don't we? So there are fewer side effects. So uh, very exciting when SSRIs came on the market. Now, if you're looking for an example of an SSRI, uh, look no further than Lexapro. Lexapro is uh, a very big one. Now, we also have selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Now, if you go back to the lecture on depression, we said the primary neurotransmitter at play is serotonin, right? But the secondary neurotransmitter is norepinephrine. So we have selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, which target exclusively norepinephrine. Examples of that are Stratera. Now you might have heard of Stratera as a ADHD medication because it also helps with um, focus, but it Stratera is really designed for depression. So it's uh, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And then we have the possibility of having the combined serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which says we're targeting both uh, serotonin and norepinephrine, but not dopamine. That's very important, but not dopamine, because the M -O M -A -O -I targets dopamine as well. So what's an example of uh, a medication that targets both serotonin and norepinephrine? Effects are. Now, Effexor is uh, another one of those drugs that people really, really love, especially if they're worried about uh, sleep problems, because Effexor, when it increases um, your norepinephrine, that increases alertness so that perhaps the oversleeping and the tired nature that one might get on another medication is reduced. So people love effects or because it doesn't alter the sleep as much. So let's evaluate our second generation antidepressants. Well, there are some good things, right? It's very hard to overdose on these drugs. Now we talk about um, a toxic dose and a lethal dose, right? And we need a therapeutic index of a minimum of three to one, which means uh, three 
doses of medication more versus one, right? So uh, you would have to take three times your prescribed dose to overdose. That's the lowest therapeutic index one has. But when we look at second generation antidepressants, uh, they have much higher therapeutic indexes, which means that you could take, and I'm not encouraging it, 10 times and you still wouldn't overdose. So it's harder to overdose on these second generation antidepressants. You also have uh, no dietary restrictions like the MAOIs. Excuse me. You remember MAOIs, you couldn't have cheese or chocolate or caffeine. There are so many different things you couldn't have that tyramine. So you got rid of the dietary restrictions. And uh, the side effects are fewer than tricyclics as well. And the need to stay on them for the rest of your life is, is pretty much gone. So there's a lot of benefits to these second generation antidepressants. The drawback is that it does affect sex drive and, and orgasm. So many of these antidepressants uh, affect uh, both arousal. So it's harder to become aroused and it takes longer to, to have an orgasm. So when you, whenever you hear sexual side effects, that's what they're talking about. Now, what's, what's an interesting finding is that if people have premature ejaculation, it's not uncommon for them to be prescribed an antidepressant to prolong their sexual activity. So there are off-label uses of these drugs as well. Now, let's talk about brain stimulation. We talked about ECT, but there are other uh, approaches to brain stimulation. So the vagus nerve, uh, which is your 10th cranial nerve, um, we can put in a pulse generator to increase the firing of the vagus nerve or stimulating the brain that has some evidence that it improves mood. One that has become very popular is TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation where they pass uh, mag magnetic current uh, across the brain and they stimulate the prefrontal cortex and it increases mood. Now, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is much safer than electroconvulsive shock therapy because you're not inducing those seizures. Um, you're just stimulating the, the brain act activity or the brain region. And then um, we talked about Brodman's area 25 being implicated in depression. Deep brain stimulation is used to try and uh, recalibrate activity here because we said too much activity in Brodman's area and too little activity could in induce a mood state. So that's our treatments for depression. So I'm going to stop the recording here, but uh, I hope, I know that George, you mentioned, are we going to talk about different medications? I hope that this gave you a primer on some of the medications for mood disorders, right? Particularly unipolar depression. Let me stop here and I'm going to reset for a second video on treatment of bipolar.